the Marine Corps, especially my unit, they were not underestimating Saddam's army. This is a formidable adversary, 7th, 8th largest army in the world or something like that. They have T-55s, they've got T-72s, chemical and biological weapons. We sat there for 60 days and it was brutal, man. Everybody's got a plan until first contact, you know. The Iraqi army was firing at known avenues of ingress. It's kind of funny, you know, for Marines and going to combat, you know, one of the big things is like, we want our combat action ribbon. And we had our combat action ribbon in like the first couple minutes. Watching an RPG come directly at you is, you know exactly what's happening. And fortunately for us, again, an inexperienced army, they weren't pulling pins. And so we were having impacts all around us. Oh, and they're just not going, not going off. Holy fuck. Welcome to Mic Drop, the podcast where relevancy is irrelevant and we don't give a shit about your feelings. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, it's both an honor and a pleasure to welcome my next guest to the podcast. You spent ten and a half years in the United States Marine Corps, several of which as an infantryman, and then several of which as a MARSOC Raider. Uh, transitioned over into SEER instructor, uh, both as active duty and then as a contractor. Moved over from there and spent uh, about seven years with the Texas State DPS, uh, four of which with patrol and now three as a special agent. He's a financial hobbyist we'll kinda, uh, with a, a YouTube channel talking about uh, all, all things Dave Ramsey-ish. We'll put a link in the description for that. He works for the man, but he also is the man, so he works for himself. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Christian Holloway. Great to be here, man. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for coming up. Um, a ton of stuff to get into, um, and I'm really excited that you're here. I, I can't wait to pick your brain on all the stuff that you've done in the military as well as kind of what you're doing uh, DPS state trooper wise. Uh, why do you think that we are here as a species? Great question. Um, well, <laughs> getting into religion first and foremost, I, I guess. Yeah, cause I, I mean, if that's yeah, your cup of tea. Yeah, least, that's, that's, that's my uh, cup of tea. I'm, I'm a Christian. So I think we're, we're here because, uh, you know, God put us here and, uh, and that's it. You know, I kind of think about that more more spiritually, you know. Uh, God's planet, this is what we're here for, is to, to live the best life that we can. And Do you uh, think, think of it from a, I guess, like a, from a global standpoint or, or <clears throat> you know, from a planetary standpoint, I guess, like what, what do you think separates human beings from everything else? What separates everything else from, you know, human being or, or, you know, you know, us in, in our lives is, you know, I think, you know, God has put mankind on the planet and everything else around us, right? Animals, nature, and all that, um, in one way, shape, form, or fashion, um, to, you know, interact with humans and, and, uh, and it, they all serve a purpose and, you know, ideally kind of be able to cohabitate and just, just live. Yeah. Yeah, one thing I'm curious of, um, I mean, I have my thoughts on it, I guess, but to me, like, the, you know, to, to pinpoint one thing that makes us different than everything else is, I, like, obviously there's, I, I don't know that there's a way to know it, but it seems like, uh, you know, it's reasonable to, to ascertain that human beings are the only creature on the planet that understand that they're going to die one day. Uh, to me, which is, is kind of fascinating, which I think also creates the the conundrum that we have in terms of searching for purpose whereas i don't think animals do because they don't even realize that, that they're going to die i mean sure they have a, a fight or flight instinct and they sense danger and understand something that's dangerous and, and fleeing or fighting or, or whatever but there's not that logic and reason i don't think um you know so i'm curious like to me that seems like a double-edged sword you know where because we have that it, it makes a uh, a certain almost misery exists within within life of understanding it's like well if we're all going to die die one day then what's the fucking point gotcha you know? yep what's your take on that yeah i think that is actually a, an interesting dynamic and um it's uh you know one of those things that it, it maybe maybe because of my experiences and stuff like that you know the way i kind of think about it is is uh you know everybody's going to go at some point, you know, I'm just going to have to, and I think what most people, you know, ought to do is really just live their life the best as possible. And, 
and also understand, you know, this is uh, like life is short. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, I'm okay with that. There's, there's a lot of people that, you know, I think that's a, a subject that kind of haunts them almost to a certain extent in their life, you know. I, I'll give you an example. In our world, you know, we have, uh, you know, a lot of guys that, you know, are in the military, they get out and see everything that's going on in the world, and they kind of keep, it, it's really negative, right? Um, it's ha- kind of hard to see positive in all the things that are going on right now. I almost kind of think about it differently, though. Uh, you know, there's, there is an opposite narrative that's like, hey, right now, actually, it's not that bad of a time to be living. Um, and... So I just try to be objective, you know what I mean? I've seen bad, uh, and, you know, I think we've got it pretty good here in America. Yeah. And, and then another thing is, like, in that kind of, like, you go down that doomsday rabbit hole, right? Get into preparedness. And um, a lot of people will go to great extents to have all these preparations. They've got every single angle covered, you name it. They've got a way to kind of survive. And to a certain extent, I get that. I see value in that because I, I certainly value life. But then again, I also understand that, uh, you know, my days are numbered. And, uh, you know, ultimately, I, do, I don't want to, like, be in a situation where I'm Mad Maxing it yeah. for, like, two years straight because I know – all the shit that's going to be happening during those times. And it's not going to be, if that were to ever happen, you know, it's, it's going to be tough. Yeah. There's going to be a lot of tragedy. There's going to be a lot of uh, bad shit that you're going to see. So me and my wife and I, we, we have some property uh, just west of Fort hood. I mean, kind of joke, man, that, you know, like if that's probably a target, right? Maybe it's nuclear war type of situation. Fort hood could be a, could be a target, I suppose. And, uh, we're, we're fairly close to it, so like, but, it, but it's in the country, and it's, that's kind of like our happy place, right, where we go to get out of the city and just disconnect, right? So we're going to Mad Max it there, yeah. <laughs> and once we get there, whatever happens, happens, man. Yeah. And we're, we're within the blast range where we're just going to get vaporized, and we're both cool with that. Yeah. Like, because, again, ultimately, we're all going to die at some point, so... Yeah. I think that's a good a good point and a good attitude, and I agree. Like, there's I look at the same thing with security or, you know, caring. I mean, there's a certain level of paranoia that I think is good and healthy and smart, but there's there's also an easy path to where you're overdoing it. You know, and, absolutely. And so yeah, I, I agree. All right, hey guys, I want to take a a second to talk about ads, um, and this is not an ad. This is me talking about the ads. I know that. Um, you know, sometimes we get comments of, of people bitching about the ads. There's too many ads or they're too long or what have you. And I, I want to clear two things up, which is number one is that my slash our team's ability to bring you guests and, and bring them in and, and the accommodations and, and the entire process that it takes to produce these shows to the level with which we do uh, requires funding, you know, and the, the sponsors give us an ability to bring these shows to you. So while I understand that everybody wants zero ads and, and everything bunched together and, and what have you, this is how we, we bring this show to you. Uh, you know, we're a very small team. We're very fortunate to, to be able to do it, uh, but we do still have to, uh, to pay bills and, and bring that to you. So keep that in mind. That's the first point. And the second point is that I can assure you with 100% accuracy is that there is not a sponsor or a product that I talk about on here that isn't something that I use, okay, that, that I either regularly use or always use or have used, and, and I refuse to budge on that, okay? So we, we get uh, offers for, for sponsors regularly that, that get turned down because it's not stuff that I use or would use. So keep that in mind. Uh, have a little bit of flexibility in terms of our ads and, and realize that, they're products that I believe in, that I stand behind, and they're what what make this show possible. So if you support these advertisers, these sponsors, that is supporting the show. Thank you.
What are the two key components for canine success? That's effective training and proper nutrition. Fueled by Team Dog brings those two components to your family and best friend. The perfect nutritional balance that results in a higher mental acuity, energy, overall vitality, and even an improved appearance. Every product you will find in my company's store was born from the battlefield and not from the boardroom. Let my life's work help you become your dog's hero. Uh, what's the last full book that you read? Um, David Goggins can't hurt me. Yeah, think so. Yeah. What did you think of it? I liked it. Yeah. yeah. What uh, is there a single takeaway that stands above all else from it? Of course, with his with his uh, you know kind of his overall overall message of just you know mental toughness and um, you know the biggest challenge I think you're going to face is yourself. Yeah. And um, and then obviously like perseverance. Yeah. You know, in that book, just uh, his story, everything that he kind of overcame. And I, I feel like I kind of have a similar, like I can relate for him. Like, for example, getting into the special operations community. Initially, when he tried to go the Air Force route, he didn't do well. He had some limitations. And uh, I remember before getting into special operations in the Marine Corps, it was a brand new thing. One thing at that time with the Marine Corps, nobody really knew anything else besides recon. That was really the only thing that Marines knew were elite. You know, we don't have a lot of uh, essay into Army's programs and the Navy's programs. But I was intimidating. I, I was intimidated. Uh, and, of course, I knew my limitations. And so uh, I knew that those were going to be something that I was going to have to face, like, head on going into the, you know, the pipeline and then being able to hold my own in that community. So, uh, you know, I can relate to, to him and, and failing and, and having to, you know, kind of reset and can just continue trying, like, if you want hard enough, right? And I remember, like, going through our pipeline, like, I really, really wanted it, you know. I kind of gave myself a mentally, mentally like, a, a no-fail situation, um, regardless, you know what I mean? If there was a timeline, I was going to meet it, whatever it was going to be, a grade, and so I, I can relate there, but I, re, I really like that, you know, that mental aspect of it. Yeah. I'd love to have him on here. I invited him on a few years ago uh, to no avail, obviously, but uh, I, I don't think he would come on, but I would sure love to get him on here. Um, what's your favorite, uh, or I'm sorry, what, uh, what is your morning routine? It's pretty straightforward. Um, usually first things first is, is uh, coffee. What time do you get up? Pretty early, around five. Um, and, uh, it's coffee. It's getting the dogs out, getting them fed, and uh, and I uh, I'm scrolling. You know, I'm, I'm I am I'm hitting the phone. I'm not. Uh, I know that's not you know the best thing to do in the morning, but um, I'm looking at the markets, man. I'm you know big into big into finance, so I'm always kind of looking to where okay, what's uh, what's the direction of the market today? You know, is there going to be an opportunity to, to to buy something good? Yeah. And uh, do you do and, a lot of day trading that way? Like no, no. I don't do any day trading. Um, uh, I'm, I'm pretty conservative. So, uh, and, uh, certainly buying, right. If I, if I find a good company, good stock that I've been kind of looking after and it, it gets into a good range, a good buy range, good value territory, um, I'll buy. So I'm kind of looking at that, you know, yeah. where's the market going? What are the news? A lot of that, of course, is tied up with the news and the decisions the government's making with, yeah. um, you know, policy and stuff like that. So you mess with crypto at all? So no, not not really. I do own Bitcoin and a, a little bit of Ethereum, but that's it. And uh, I don't I don't really uh, entertain any other crypto asset. And to a certain extent, I think I would be kind of more uh, along the line of what people call a, a, a Bitcoin maximalist. So there's a lot of folks out there in the crypto world that I believe. I've really been able to see everything and understand how crypto works very well. And, and then they all kind of resort back to uh, Bitcoin as being the most valuable, the one crypto asset that like, if you're going to speculate that that's probably the best asset to speculate on the original crypto. Yeah. Um, and a big part of that is decentralization. So a lot of these other crypto assets are governed by people. Yeah. They, they can be manipulated by people where Bitcoin is still truly decentralized you know the guy who made it is 
you know, he's he's gone. Nobody's ever yeah, you know, ghost. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, what's your, what's your? Uh, I agree. I mean, I I don't mess with it at all uh, anymore. But um, it, it's a fascinating asset class for sure. It is. Which, uh, we can get into that a little bit later when we start talking about some of your finance stuff. But uh, what's your favorite childhood memory? Definitely have a few. I had a, I had a good childhood. I got great folks. Uh, you know, grew up with a pretty big family. So, um, uh, I would say sports. Um, you know, uh, had I was in baseball growing up. You know, that was big in my life. Um, so just you know, tournaments, being being with my parents, and my brother, playing baseball. Um, and you know what, like. Also, you know, a good memory I have of my childhood is just kind of like I, I feel fortunate that my, my folks were able to uh, allow us to kind of have that carefree mindset and just be kids. Yeah. You know, jump on the jump on the bike at a big neighborhood. So, you know, we'd play sports together as kids and just have that carefree uh, kid attitude and, and be able to have fun. Yeah. I agree. I'm right there with you. I, uh, I loved that growing up and I hate that that's not the case anymore, uh, largely. Uh, where are you from originally? Round Rock. Grew up in oh, Round okay. Rock, Texas. Uh, you said you had a big family. Did, tell us about uh, just o- overall growing up and, and what uh, that was like in Round Rock. Sure. So um, had some, you know, aunt and uncle and some cousins there in, in Round Rock. Had a, a brother, um, two half sisters. And um, unfortunately, grew up quite a bit of my childhood with my brother. A uh, little couple years older than me uh committed suicide on my third deployment oh shit yeah, I'm so sorry to hear that. that was really shitty and uh uh but you know still had a you know my childhood was 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 good and uh we had family reunions pretty traditional you know um so uh we would you know have some family in oklahoma as well some actually here in this area so we would travel all the time and have family reunions and uh from both sides of my family, actually. So yeah, so you played uh, a lot of baseball growing up. Uh, I, I guess was was there a a transition or a a motivation, a, a catalyst for you to to decide to want to join the Marine Corps? Like was it was it like a holy shit, this is what I want to do, or was it gradual? Uh, I was probably gradual. Initially, I wanted to go to the Air Force. My dad was a retired Air Force officer, so kind of every standard kid who wants to go to the military uh, a lot of you know people want to be a fighter pilot i thought that's what i wanted to do grew up got in the, you know in high school and i was a knucklehead and, you know i wasn't i wasn't going to college <laughs> so uh uh so the marine corps infantry was yep. the next best bet and initially my dad was really reluctant about that he was just like god dang you know this is not smart you know yeah. air force were like you know be smart you know yeah but and you know marine corps infantry completely opposite but you know, I was influenced by a couple guys, a, a grade above me. They both went Marine Corps Infantry, and they came at, came back, you know, on leave, and I would see them, and we'd hang out. And, uh, man, I just saw how changed they were. Like, they were completely new people. And they all had the, you know, what I wanted at that time, what I needed. I, I definitely knew I was going in the military, you know, kind of wanted to go to the Air Force, but... Once I started learning about the Marine Corps, yeah, I drank the Kool-Aid quick. Yeah. It didn't take much work for my recruiter. Yeah. Um, all right, so you, when you joined, um, the fir- those first four years or, or uh, actually a little more than that, um, in terms of the infantry experience, uh, you came in at a pretty busy and interesting time. Yeah. Uh, when did 9-11 happen in relation to when you enlisted? Yeah, th- I think I was a junior in high school during 9-11. Very similar story. I've heard this story, and I just think it's interesting that mine was the same. I was, like, in economics class. Everything stopped. TVs were on. Watched the plane hit the towers, right? Um, and that, that certainly played a role in kind of, like, influencing me uh, to want to serve. And um, so I graduated in o two the next year. And I uh, graduated a little bit early and was already in the debt program and uh, had a had a seat in in boot camp June of June of 02. Yeah. So you go to boot camp, go right through uh, 
you go to Paris or San Diego? San Diego. Uh, and to uh, Camp Pendleton and did uh, School of Infantry. O three hundred the whole the whole bit. Yeah. And, and then uh, I made it. Yeah. <laughs> Was, was there anything that stood out during that uh, that initial process that's outside the norm of the typical experience? Like, was there were there any exceptions for you? Anything that happened that was? Uh, yeah, I would. I, I think so because the the, uh, the the attitude was we're going to war. Everybody, you know, like we hadn't invaded Iraq at, at the time, of course, but we had a presence in Afghanistan, and there was already a Marine unit that had been deployed to Afghanistan and that had come back, and a couple guys that had transitioned over to like their instructor duty. So I had a couple school of school of infantry instructors that were um, they had just come back from Afghanistan, and so they were like, "This is happening, you know, um, you know this this isn't over." And there was already talks about you know Iraq, so and it didn't take long from got done with school of infantry, and I guess maybe October November time frame in O two, and then um, went to the fleet. Got to the fleet in oh, uh, November of O two, I believe. They were already in a workup, uh, so I fell right into a workup, like the battalion culminating exercise, you know, CACs. Uh, and there was there was talk, right? You know, we're we're gonna get be, we're gonna be deployed. Still wasn't like we're going to Iraq at this time or anything like that. Went on Christmas leave, came back, and then after that, it was all right. We're going to Iraq. And uh, and we're leaving soon. Yeah. So I left pretty soon, right right thereafter. Only had a couple months in the fleet before I was sitting in Kuwait, ready to roll. Yeah, and and that was in in '03 or in '03. Yeah. I mean, we were there almost probably the same time then. But uh, all right. So for you, I mean, as a as a young man and not having been in the military for a very long time, and now you find yourself getting ready to go to war. What was going through your head during that uh, that build up? A lot of confusion, to be honest, you know, because, you know, I, I understood Afghanistan, the whole Iraq part. I was, you know, I, I was 17, 18 years old, wasn't up with like politics and, and foreign policy, even though I was in the Marine Corps and I, I knew I was there to serve and do all that. I still, it was a little tough kind of like, okay, where are we going and, and why are we going over there? What's What's happening, you know? And um, then more of the, you know, the narrative of that link between Iraq and Afghanistan and weapons of mass destruction, and that started to become a little bit more um, clear. So I was like, okay. Um, and the Marine Corps, especially my unit, they were not underestimating Saddam's army. You know, they were like, this is a uh, formidable adversary, like seventh, eighth largest army in the world or something like that they have t-55s they've got t-72s um obviously they have <laughs> chemical and biological weapons they showed the world that they uh have used them yeah with the kurds so you know the threat of nbc was a big deal that and to be honest that 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 scared me you know that kind of creeped me out yeah it's one thing to you know, i was a automatic rifleman so i've got a saw had a thousand rounds in my body at all times. Pretty small guys running around with all that gear. It's one thing, but just all the gear. Being mop four to do it with the mask on your face was I was intimidating for me. So I can remember that just just hoping, like, man, I really hope it doesn't get to that. Yeah. What uh, do you remember the first time where you, where you guys were in country and you were like, holy shit, like this is real? Yeah, it didn't take long for for me at all. Yeah, tell us about that. Um, we got contact uh, on the LOD line of departure. We were getting fired at by, uh, which was where great question. I was a private. I wish I could tell you <laughs> that's the, not that that's, I won't tell you. So I can't fucking it's tell you. the thing about being a private in the, inf uh, yeah. in the infantry is absolutely zero situational awareness. I didn't have a map. You know, I didn't have comms. I didn't even have MVGs. I didn't have sappy plates. Uh, so uh, you know, I was in third battalion, fourth Marines, first Marine division, seventh Marine regiment. So, uh, I know we were, uh, you know, the, the, the portion of where we, where we crossed, like our line of departure was open desert, rural near Basra. So I think, you know, the first objective was 
Safwan Hill, if I remember correctly, that was going to be primarily air and indirect. And then we're pushing to Basra. That was the first uh, objective. So we were within the vicinity of, of Basra, which is in South Iraq, the southern portion of the country, of course. Um, and other than that, I was in the middle of the desert. And uh, so, and you know, we had done drills where we're loading up from the rear in, in Kuwait where everybody was staged. I don't know the name of that that area, Camp Ripper maybe, I forget. I think it was named after the call sign for 7th Marines. I, I don't remember. But, uh, you know, there was, there was times where we're loading up and we're pushing out there, and it was kind of like more of like a rehearsal. It's, to a certain extent, I kind of thought, I was like, I'm, I'm not sure if this is actually going to happen. I'm not sure if, because there was also like, you know, in the in the Lance Corporal Underground in the Marine Corps, there was like, well, in, in Desert Storm, there was never actual an, an actual real invasion. It was more of like a show of force. And, of course, there was it, it got kinetic, um, but it wasn't like we pushed deep into Iraq. So I I was like, man, I'm, I'm not even sure we're, we're actually going to push and commit to this thing. Uh, and next thing you know, we're seeing explosions in the distance and the explosions are getting closer. And it was like, okay, this is getting real. But it was a little weird though, because they were far. It, it wasn't up close and personal, um, but it was an artillery piece. They were, years later, I actually just Google searched this because a lot of that is also just lost in time. There's a lot of stuff that I don't remember. It was a long time ago now. And being a private with no essay, I was like, man, I would love to have some sort of like historical reference to try to, and there was an actual article written about that particular instance. And I guess what they were doing is the Iraqi army was firing at known avenues of ingress. So they already were able to kind of tell where it would be likely where U.S. forces would cross. And they proactively and preemptively started firing indirect at those areas and that was right at our at our area yeah uh, so they were you know grounds were getting closer and closer then it became like oh shit you know what are we gonna do we don't have air assets uh and i we're in fighting holes we're dug in in the defense around our tracks our amphibious assault vehicles uh mop three at this point and i remember looking back and like looking at our headquarters Amtrak, where like the uh, company commander uh, rides, and he's got all the platoon commanders around and, and platoon sergeants, and they really didn't know. It, they looked like they didn't know what to do, and seeing that uncertainty on them was like shit. You know, I was like, they don't have a good way to like combat this, right? Like, it's kind of hard to get away from indirect fire. So as the rounds kind of get kept getting closer, they just got to the point where they were like. Just get in your holes and take cover. Like, don't even face outboard. And that was weird because it's like on security and the defense, you're always facing towards your sector of fire. To just Ignore. grab your your weapon and just get down in your holes and take cover was like, shit, they, they don't have a, a means of combating this. And unfortunately, uh, heard the, the sound of a cobra coming over. And... Uh, Watched it completely annihilate an artillery piece at night now. Night had kind of set in on MVGs, on my 17 Bravos. I didn't have rounds in the gun at that time. <laughs> if people realize if I'm looking towards or in 17 Bravos at an aircraft, you know, it's I didn't have rounds in at the time. I took them out. That was my only way to watch. Everybody else had head-mounted MVGs old seven bravos but as a saw gunner i didn't i only had 17 bravos so you know i'm coming in and out of my my night vision bird just stops in the air all you see is the ir light you know and then just opens up with guns and the you just see the, the destruction and all the sparks it was badass yeah i can imagine and then it, as soon as that wrapped up they were like load up we're pushing and that was my entry into the war so it it's kind of funny, you know, <clears throat> for, for Marines and going to combat, you know, one of the big things is, like, we want our combat action ribbon. It's the only ribbon on a, a stack that infantry Marines give a shit about. And we had our combat action ribbon in, like, the first 
couple minutes. Yeah. <laughs> That's wild, man. Was it just the one artillery piece? I think so. Yeah. I think at least towards our avenue that yeah. that we were approaching. Um, but I think there were multiple artillery pieces firing in multiple directions. Yeah. So what, what was the rest of that deployment like? Honestly, out of the two, the three combat deployments that I have, I think that was, it was certainly the most kinetic. Um, and it was pretty wild because it was the invasion. So it was, the dynamic was completely different. And the subsequent deployments were fighting in, in insurgency, terrorists. This, this deployment were fighting a nation state. Um, and the Marines, of course, were, uh, you know, other than special operations forces, we're, there's nobody else in front of us, you know. We were the that leading effort all the way up to Baghdad. Um, what was the path you guys took from uh, the, that you know of? I mean, I know, do you know any towns that you came into? Yeah, yeah, a few. Um, so after, so initially, and we hit Basra. That didn't take long. And, and after, after we crossed, we had no resistance. The air campaign. And that's consistent throughout the whole deployment. I'll throw that out there. And I just give credit to our air capability and indirect fire capability because it played such a huge role our whole way up there. And uh, I'm thankful for that. But um, we hit Basra. Um, it was it was nighttime. I really don't remember a lot. We were, I remember we were waiting for the British to come relieve us. The British came and relieved us in their tanks. I was also rolling with a company of uh, tanks from 1st Tank Battalion. My company actually was attached to 1st Tank Battalion, which I thought was really cool because we always had Abrams around us. So there was that sense of confidence, you know. Um, so we hit Basra. I think we were kind of like on the outskirts of Nazaria, but we were not like in Nazaria when a lot of the fighting went down and where Jessica Lynch got captured. That's wild because I was right there during that time. So, we were so then I I got a quick question for you. Yeah. Because I I, I vividly remember, <clears throat> of course, Marines we're the only <laughs> the only people in woodland mop suits in a desert environment. However, I rem I remember, and I'm pretty sure this was the invasion, um, a convoy of black Toyota Tacomas cruising by us with in guys with desert mop suits in like two forties in the back. And I was told that was NSW. It probably was. Uh, it was not us, I can tell you that. Uh, my guess is that it was probably Dev Group, but I don't know, because they were there in that in that uh, area in that time. I mean, they, they did the Jessica Lynch rescue. I mean, we watched it from where we were at. Like we saw, we were probably maybe two miles from uh, from the hospital when they did it. So, And there was a, <clears throat> uh, there was a Ranger Battalion. I want to say it was 3rd that was there um, as their blocking force, and, and some of their guys were coming in and out of our, our little camp. We were at the 15th Marine Expeditionary Unit at that time out okay. in the outskirts of Nazaria and going going in and out of the city for a period of a few weeks. But, uh, yeah, it's fucking wild, man. It's yeah. a small world, I guess. Small yeah. world. All right, guys, as you know, I'm into uh, health and fitness uh, and specifically how nutrition relates to it. Um, coffee is a, has been a staple of mine and, and I think most people's for a long time. Um, as you know, I'm a big uh, proponent of Mudwater, which is a sponsor of this show. They have been uh, for a while now and, and we have a great partnership. I love their product. Um, it's a phenomenal alternative to coffee. Uh, for me, you know, coffee, there's jitters, there's mold in it. Uh, you know, a lot of times it tends to, to kind of upset my stomach. Uh, but mud water has adaptogenic uh, mushrooms. Um, there's a fraction of the caffeine that coffee has. There's a little bit, but it's very, very little. Um, and it, it really leans on, on mushrooms and the blend of matcha and chai for kind of that sustained energy that, that continues to go and, and doesn't crash the way coffee does when, uh, when it runs out. Uh, they use lion's mane for alertness, cordyceps to support physical performance, chaga and raishi to support the immune system, turmeric for soreness, and cinnamon for antioxidants. Um, I, I really enjoy that first cup of warm liquid in the morning by taking mud water instead of coffee, and I'll put uh, just a splash of, of heavy cream uh, or even some protein powder, uh, some collagen powder, um, and 
I also throw uh, usually a couple drops of uh, stevia or uh, monk fruit vanilla to make it kind of a, a thick, normal morning coffee ritual type of uh, concoction. And uh, I got to tell you, it, it it does wonders for me. And and I'm really really glad that I switched. It's been you know better part of a year now, uh, you know that I've been taking that uh, and using that as part of my uh, daily morning routine. And it's fantastic. I love it. I I can't re- recommend it enough. Uh, it's 100% USDA, uh, organic, non-GMO, gluten-free, vegan, and kosher certified. Uh, and they also donate to the Berkeley Center for Science of Psychedelics, which is uh, you know, groundbreaking and leading research to help veterans with PTSD uh, and other uh, associated illnesses and, and uh, syndromes. So uh, great cause, great company, phenomenal product. If you go to Mudwater, that's M-U-D-W-T-R dot com forward slash Mike to su- support this show and the product uh, and use the code Mike Mud M I K E M U D all caps for fifteen percent off. That's again Mudwater M U D W T R dot com forward slash Mike and the code is Mike Mud M I K E M U D all caps for fifteen percent off. Go check them out. All right, as you guys know the lifestyle changes and the the fast pace that we live, uh, it makes it difficult to get in, uh, you know, all of the vitamins, minerals, fruits, vegetables, et cetera. Uh, Started working with First Form. Uh, It's a great company. Uh, Everybody knows who they are, and and, uh, I've been trying their stuff for a while now, and I I love it. Uh, In particular, their OptiGreens 50. It's a precisely formulated green superfood powder uh, that increases overall immune system support and digestive health. Uh, 80% of your immune system is located in your gut and digestive tract, so healthy digestion is essential for overall health and wellness. It's got 50 hand-chosen ingredients, um, and its taste and texture are like no other product. It's not gritty. It's got a sweet berry flavor. Uh, 100% of all the greens ingredients are grown and manufactured in the USA. Um, you know, For me, this is a, a really good one-stop shop to uh, to get all the extra stuff that you need. There's a lot of greens out there. This is uh, a product I stand behind, I take, I enjoy it, uh, and and notice a remarkable difference in uh, just overall the way that I feel. My my gut health and digestion is uh, is noticeably improved. It's a green superfood blend. It's a phytonutrient blend. Uh, it's a glycemic balance blend. It's not going to spike your your blood sugar. It's got digestive enzyme blends and probiotics in it. It's a great product. Uh, Andy Frizzella and, and First Form is a phenomenal company that uh, you know is very supportive of. The veteran community and uh, I just I can't say enough good things about him and the company so OptiGreens 50 uh, just a, a great product and uh, they're they're a fantastic sponsor and supporter of Mike Drop. Was the fighting uh, at that time for you guys I mean were, were there levels of resistance that you guys encountered where it was full-blown like battling it out with dudes or was it pretty limited? Um, it, at least initially limited and then as, as we progressed we gotten a couple of pretty good ones. Um, I will say that I, I think probably out of everything that I got into, the the craziest fight or gunfight, if you want to call it that, that I got into was just after departing Basra. So still pushing north. So the British came and relieved, relieved us. And um, the way we were rolling at that time was in Abrams and then my platoon. And so we were in amphibious assault vehicles, Amtrak's. Also give it up to those guys too, because they probably got a little bit more action than we did even with the weapon systems, you know, 50 and a mark. But, um, man, we got ambushed by what I think is either an MTLB or a BMP. I don't know what either of those are. Russian APC. You know, really? The Russian suite of everything the Iraqi army had. So, yeah, so we were in an armor to armor engagement at close range. Um, So, and I, as I've processed this over the years, I've kind of thought there was, I I know there were tank kills, like our Marine Corps tanks had tank kills, but at distance. Um, And there wasn't that many, but an actual like, APC to APC with a tank, close range engagement. It happened, and I've also kind of asked my myself because, <laughs> long story short, 
we made really quick work of that vehicle and uh and there were some dismounts first time i ever saw green tracers fly just right above me so that was the first real time i guess i almost got shot in the face but um I was kind of wondering what in the world made them make the decision to, maybe they don't have MVGs. Maybe they saw, it was nighttime, and saw an, an armored presence kind of moving. It was kind of classical ambush setup. Um, maybe they were forced to. You know, a lot of the Army, you know, that's not the, you know, a lot of the Army defected as we kind of pushed up and really showed our military might. And a lot of them didn't really want to be in that fight. Yeah, And so I'm thinking maybe that was one of those things where they were ordered to be there, ordered to do that, and they reluctantly did because, again, they opened up with main gun, which in on my flank. So I'm on security in our AAV. The hatches, you know, open up up top. I'm a short dude. I'm standing on, like, two MRE boxes. <laughs> my knees are bouncing against, like, javelin missiles and small rockets <laughs> that are attached to the inside, you know, and, uh, fortunately for me also another shitty part about being a private in the, in the infantry in war is that your senior guys steal all the action. Yeah. And so a lot of the times you're, you're buttoned up in the, in the track, there's shit going on. The amp trackers are getting it. Your senior guys are up there getting it and you're just stuck <laughs> and like, come on, get me, you know, let me Put get me in coach. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, fortunately for me this time, it was right in my face, and uh, it was interesting because again, it was I was not in my optic, so I'm just looking into, I'm just looking into blackness, and just see this burst go right over the vehicle in front of us and miss high. Fortunately, uh, machine gun fire. I don't know if it's there's there's a a ton of different weapon systems that can be outfitted on those uh, BMPs, twelve seven and more beyond. And I was just like, you know, holy shit, because th th it was really close. And, you know, I've talked, I, I kind of went back to and, and tried to review this moment with my platoon commander and, and run it by him and be like, man, I think, you know, it was about this close. What, from your perspective, what would you say? So I'm not like that fisherman that it was like, man, it was this yeah. big, right? And he's like, man, 75 meters, like at best. So it was real close, and then I'm like, holy shit, and I get down to my optic, and I can see the vehicle clear. And then very quickly, fortunately, uh, I think the, the vehicle, the, the Amtrak that was in front of that, obviously everybody's oriented towards our left flank now, and um, an Amtrak opened up with 50 on the vehicle and just sparks everywhere, you know, good impacts. And then... What seemed like three seconds later, I'm talking immediate action drills. This was textbook. Tank turret spun, and I believe it was a saber round. Fired a saber round in this thing and just completely annihilated it. And watching that, like, at close range, in and out of MVGs, right, because I'm also trying to communicate with all of my squad leaders and team leaders, you know, in the vehicle, let them know what's going on. Um it was wild, man. Yeah. The the explosion on the vehicle from the tank round was it was like something you see in movies where like there was like these fireballs that came off this vehicle. And then shortly after that, it wrapped up real quick. I got a burst of uh, maybe AK or RPK over my head towards my vehicle, which I'm assuming was from dismounts. So dudes survived the fucking... Well, I think they had dismounts on the ground. Already. Because it's an APC, yeah. so it's like infantry guys. So before it got hit with the Sabo round, it... Uh, it already had some guys unasked on. and were moving towards you guys. Fired, opened up. I thought it was weird. I, I hesitated for a moment. I kind of like looking down, and my, my team leader's like trying to get up there with me, and he's like, fire back. You know, obviously, it's, <laughs> it's the bad guys, right? So I opened up. And, you know, got a good burst in, and we roll. No comms. It. I have no clue what's going on. Usually in that typical scenario, the, the, the IA drill is you the infantry dismounts, 
you push through the kill zone and make sure everything's dead and and uh, police up any intel, destroy anything that needs to be destroyed, load back up and go. You guys just bailed. No, we just rolled. So you have no idea what the aftermath was? Nope. Wow. Um, and I asked my platoon commander about that 15 years later. And he's like, because I asked him, I said, I, I kind of described it to him like that because honestly, years later, as I've processed that, I'm like, uh, you know, am I remembering everything correctly? And I described it to him. I literally wrote it in a message to him. And I said, this is what I remember. Is that accurate? And he was like, you nailed it, man, spot on. And he goes, I, I created that plan. When we departed Basra, we, we departed in, in platoons, by platoon. So we were moving as a platoon. So an Amtrak and three, or an Abrams and three, three tracks, and that's it. So we had adjacent friendly forces to our flanks, maybe a few hundred meters, taking their own route to wherever our next rally point was. But we were kind of rolling as that single unit. And I think what it was was, we, we got to stay up with them. We got contact, but if we get out and kind of push through this thing, it was still so confusing. That was within the first 48 hours. Yeah. So I think my platoon commander was like, obviously everything is dead. Let's roll. Yeah. Let's stay in line. Let's make sure that we meet our timelines and, you know, whatever. Yeah. So that's fucking wild, man. So, and it makes sense. So you guys roll up uh, and you just keep pushing forward or, or keep pushing north until you hit Baghdad. Was there pockets of shit here mm -hmm. and there on the way there? Yep. Nothing crazy? Nothing. I mean, we, nothing crazy, I guess. But there was one uh, pretty, I think it was actually a pretty cool because it was like a traditional, I got to do like a traditional infantry assault. And I was just talking about how like we didn't do what we're kind of supposed to do. Yeah. I actually did. We got word that uh, there were some RPGs being fired at a tank. I don't know why the tanks didn't deal with them, but they decided to to kind of task my infantry platoon to take down this this house. And this is still in like a rural area, so not not urban. It's more of like farm farmlands in a, a house, if you want to call it that. Maybe more of like a, a big hut. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're familiar with southern Iraq, it's still you know very rural. And uh, so we did a very traditional setup: one squad. And support by fire, second squad um, on security, and then a third squad to to advance and and push towards this house, and did it very traditional. You know, support by fire goes automatic fire, and they're suppressing the objective. And this our standoff is probably 150 meters, and so we had a bit of defile and some cover. We were using our vehicles as cover as well. Automatic fire kicked up, utilizing. Both saws and 240s, suppressing the objective as we run up. And uh, as we get close, you know, we're supposed to kind of shift fire, and they shift fire towards it to where it's a little bit safer, not right towards, like, the breach point. And crazy, uh, you know, <laughs> everybody's got a plan until first contact, <laughs> you know. the the And I think maybe they were trying to be a little more on the safe side, but the automatic fire stopped. And there was a moment of time where we were running, still running, kind of like in a ranger file towards our breach point on that objective. And we were just out in the open running. And I uh, saw some pretty badass shit. My team leader on the move uh, fired a, a 203 round, a 40 mic mic, like couldn't have had a better shot right on the breach point. Blew, and then we were in, that, in the house like seconds later. So it, was, it was kind of like it was a kind of like a quintessential infantry operation. Some dead dudes in the house. Um, but again, like the unfortunate part of being like a, a private is, hey, boot, get in that corner face outboard. You know, they're doing the fun stuff, being able to kind of like see what's going on. And I've, you know, I'm, I'm on an, uh, an area where I can't. Really, I just got to cover my sector of fire and make sure we got 360 uh, security. So, um, what was, did you ever find out, like, did you walk through the target afterwards? Um, like, how legitimate was the, like, were they fucking bad dudes or was it? Mm -hmm. how, yeah. Do you know about how many there were? No, I think, I think there was a couple. That's what 
I remember my team leader telling me. Yeah. Yeah. So you didn't get But I didn't even get to see those those guys on the inside. Yeah. I mean, I saw obviously the the destruction and everything, you know. You see all that, you you're getting that. You just had a 40 mic mic round go in. I mean, the whole outside was chewed up by 240. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, I didn't I didn't really get to see that. Didn't get to see that, you know, aftermath of that first one either. Yeah. It's kind of the un I don't know. I certainly got a bit of that. There's as we continue to progress up, there certainly gets to the point to where we're we're engaging personnel to personnel. I mean, what was the first uh, occurrence where that happened? Yeah, pushing up. I think, man. T- after that, it was in just south of Baghdad, uh, in the Diala area. So there's a Diala River south of Baghdad. My unit gets there, and if I understand correctly, because we were there, we stayed. I think we were probably there on the south side of the riverbank, maybe about 48 hours. And I remember as a, whenever it was going down, I was just like, it doesn't seem like like we're held up. Something is holding us up. Our forward momentum had completely stopped. Um, and I think it was because, if I remember reading this correctly, because I kind of tried to research it a bit, that feature wasn't on the maps. Like, the battalion commanders and the regimental commanders maps they they were not uh, anticipating that river being there and then the bridges along the river were sabotaged so then it was like okay now we were you know we got to figure this out how are we going to get our forces across you know we actually even had an amtrak splash so you know it's an amphibious assault vehicle designed to go off a, a ship into the ocean and uh we had an amtrak get in the water and try to make it across, and it couldn't make it up the riverbank on the other side. Ended up turning around, and I, th- I think they ended the, the tanks c- came in and made those artificial bridges on, on a few different crossing points. They made a few different crossing points at that time, and we ended up just the infantry just ran across a bombed out bridge, sketchy. Yeah. But uh, but on the way up there, that we started getting some resistance for sure, because we we, you know, a lot of this time we're we're driving in vehicles. And the little pockets of resistance, what I really remember a lot of that is, is the Amtrackers. They're, man, I'm telling you, man, they, they dump some ordnance. And uh, so, but you're in this pitch black box with your head bouncing against small rockets and javelins. You know, I have no clue what's going on. We don't, I don't have comms, nothing. So I'm just listening to the, and in a sense, that's kind of crazy, you know, because as that, let's say, for example, we're getting, we're, you know, Uh, contact we're getting engaged again traditionally we're supposed to stop ramp goes down after it gets out pushes through fire maneuver but you're in a black box and you have no essay you know i don't even know what direction to you know the contact is coming from yeah so you're just expecting that ramp to come down and your your squad leaders gain an essay on the fly and you're and you're making it happen uh but i mean there was just a lot of those where the am trackers in the in the tanks were getting after it and uh i'll give you an example of like the air superiority also on the way up there before we kind of really gotten some more firefights but uh i remember coming across an objective where you know it was the 232nd mechanized i don't know it was the, you know there was a unit name i just don't remember it we're gonna we're, our objective is like their garrison right it's their base and we're standing fast, and Army MLRS is going to prep the objective. And then after their, their Winchester, we're going to push through. And, of course, also at that time, you're getting as much sleep as you can at any moment, right? You're just trying to squeeze 30 minutes in here or there because we're just awake the whole time. And I remember waking up. I was, like, happy because I got, like, I looked at my watch. And I was like, man, I got a solid 20 minutes. Like, sweet. Uh, and they were like, hey, we're pushing through. That There's nothing left. We didn't even get out on that objective. We're just completely like <clears throat> on to the next one, you know, because there was nothing left to, to fight. Yeah. Uh, the and indirect all, fire and air campaign was so good. What the, what we're, in terms of the air campaign in your guys' push uh, north, what, what assets were used, do you recall? Um, to my knowledge, if I, you know, because I, I didn't see – I saw a lot of Cobras, a lot of rotary, fortunately. Uh, and I saw fixed wing, you know, 
making runs above us like in the daytime and stuff but i have no clue yeah what was dropping it's surprising the the level of um disconnect that exists in the infantry like i knew that there was a, a significant component of that but um it seems like a very poor way to conduct warfare operations is to have you know so many guys have absolutely zero fucking clue what's going on especially in a, like a traditional conventional war yeah i mean um that was a big driving force for me to want to get into marsoc yeah uh, because yeah i mean it's the marine marines are very good at what they do whenever when it comes to that and adapting right everything's improvised overcome adapt but you know how much better and i and i'm i'm sure nowadays with all the gear that the marine corps has now basic infantry guys are getting some good stuff um i hope they're at least on on fucking radios but yeah they are i and i think they're much better you know yeah. than than we were but um hey guys i wanted to uh talk about something that i've incorporated into my daily routine my morning routine that has had a remarkable impact on my life uh, it's called bio pro plus uh it's a non-synthetic hgh uh treatment and uh you know every year after puberty your hgh levels naturally drop uh, and exponentially sometimes uh, can even drop by, by 50 percent by the time you're 35 uh, i train jujitsu three four times a week i lift three four times a week and bio pro plus uh, without question uh, enhances my ability to train more uh, days per week harder recover faster uh, enhance performance i cannot say enough good things about this product i've been taking it for a few months uh, it's, it's remarkable and I will continue to, to do so. Um, if you want to, uh, you know, perform better, look better, feel better. Uh, I, I can't stress it enough. I have tried bio pro plus, uh, and I encourage you to go to bioproteintech.com uh, and you, if you want to get $30 off your first order, use the code Mike drop M I K E D R O P. And again, that's bioproteintech.com. I cannot stress enough. This stuff has uh, been a game changer for me as I've gotten older. Fixed wing, not sure, really. I'm, I'm sure some Marine Corps F-18s, um, a lot of Cobras. So a shitload of air support. It's basically knocking the fight out by the time you guys get to it. Quite a bit, yeah. Um, w w were there other instances where they didn't get all of it and you guys rolled up and you end up really battling out? You, you mentioned yep. kind of close quarters, personnel to personnel. What was that like? Yeah, and I close is relative, Uh but if it's close enough to see see sure. people that's yeah close. uh on the at the dl river yeah as we as we got up there we got quite a bit of resistance but i would say the most resistance in that deployment at that location i think it was republican guard or special Re republican guard i'm not sure and i think it was kind of like since we we're close to baghdad maybe like a last stand type of type of situation for them and uh and it this i thought i thought this was also a very interesting to see, especially as I progressed in the infantry beyond that deployment, uh, because then you know, the, as the the Marine Corps, what makes us good and really what makes all maneuver units good nowadays is our ability to fight with comp combined arms. And uh, so, you know, incorporating indirect fire all the way from you know already twenty clicks back, all the way up to the uh, the squad level with sixty millimeter mortars, um, and then machine guns. And and our vehicles, the Am Amtraks and the tanks, and in this uh, this fight, I really got to see all of that at once. It was the Marine Corps does what used to be called CACs, Combined Armed Exercise. It was the culmination of event for a battalion during a uh, a workup. <clears throat> you do this epic range in the Marine Corps in Twenty Nine Palms called uh, Range Four Hundred, and it's where you're culminating and and incorporating all of these different assets and maneuvering um towards your objective and i really got to see this for real yeah and, and air assets as well um and we got quite a bit of resistance on the way up as we were dismounted uh we got engaged again um like you know we're also like moving with like 200 dudes you know it's a, it's a pretty big force uh infantry companies around 200 guys you know we were uh moving up and this is more of an urban area at this point and kind of like a main street type of of layout as i remember we're getting close to you know the river um we get engaged by i think pkm from like an elevated position 
And, uh, you know, I remember seeing muzzle flashes and impacts uh, all around me. And the fortunately right in front of me was a machine gun team and they just got to work and just did what they do. And, you know, when it comes down to the actual mechanics, right? Our <laughs> command and control rights, a little sketchy, right? But when it comes <laughs> down to like making it happen, man, they just chewed up that, that position that he was in. It was like in a, in a building, um, kind of in an ele elevated position from what I remember. And I just remember there was no more muzzle flashes after our two forties got to work. Yeah. And then as soon as that happened, uh, my squad kind of got tasked to post security on an alley. Here's some other like infantry shit. It's pretty bad. <laughs> so we're on an alleyway. And again, you know, the corporal says, Hey boot, you know, get in the prone and orient your saw down that Avenue of approach. So we got side security. Roger that. And, um, uh, man, my squad got, we got left there. No shit. So the squad leaders got PRR comms. That, that's what they called it. It was just inner, inner squad comms, you know, line of sight, not like a 117 or anything like that, or like an inbiter. It wasn't, wasn't that. It was a, like maybe an, a better way to say it was an, an encrypted walkie talkie. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you hear all the vehicles and the movement and the talking and, you know, little gunfights kind of going on. And that just all kind of starts to get quiet. <laughs> And my squad leader pops back out like of the little alley and, and, and nobody. And, and long story short, it was just back and forth of what are we going to do? He's trying to make comms. Nobody's coming up on comms. And, you know, pretty straightforward. It's like, all right, let's move in the direction of travel, last known direction of travel. And, uh, and we'll try to link up, right? Hopefully, or thankfully, that was uneventful. We linked up with them right there at that, the southern edge of that riverbank how, how far i think it was probably like f probably 500 meters max yeah and when but what was weird about that though is when we got up there everybody's fighting it out and it was so nobody even knew that you guys were, nah. were gone and then nobody knew that you even got back they were up. too busy dealing with they were getting engaged across the river pretty good resistance i mean everything was firing tanks were firing our amtraks were firing our machine gun sections firing infantry guys are firing and um shooting across the river and you're seeing dismounts okay now you know you're clearly seeing enemy in the open and so we were trying to kind of get back into our spot you know my squad uh, link up with our platoon all right where do you need us fill that gap get some cover and start getting it and it, it happened just like that. You know, as soon as we're, we get in that position where we get uh, set, you know, we're firing and we're engaging enemy. They had a, must have had a stockpile of RPGs. There was just a, a ridiculous amount of RPGs that they were firing at us. That was, I would say, from an infra infantry perspective at this moment, the, the greatest threat. Uh, and fortunately for us, again, inexperienced army they weren't pulling pins and so we were having impacts all around us oh, and they're shit, just not going not off. going holy off holy fuck not going off and dude that's crazy yeah because you you've watching an rpg come directly at you is you know exactly what's happening yeah it's and they weren't going off and they're that's in a really effective weapon system yeah there were some going off a lot that were not a lot that were not fortunately um i think they were it was one of those things where they're like literally loading rounds as fast as they can and yeah. they're just shooting them at us but um our with everything we had and, and that kept up that kept up so much so i mean we had already firing danger close as i also kind of rec um tried to recollect this firefight with my platoon leadership he was like, dude, that shit was danger close, and they're firing 155s from 20 clicks back across the riverbank. Um, it was maybe 300 meters. Dude, that's probably not. That I mean, honestly, that that's that's being overly conservative. So it was it really wasn't that far. I mean, it was it's it wasn't the Euphrates even. It was I, I don't think at least it was the Diala River. So that distance between their riverbank and ours wasn't far. So they're Artie's firing danger close. Our mortars are firing uh, firing Willie Pete. Tank tankers are 
engaging uh, enemy uh, vehicles, buildings, and this, other than the you know the armor to armor engagement, it, through even throughout Fallujah, this firefight, this moment was certainly the most dynamic, the most going on because we also had casts. So indirect fire would stop. Cobras would come over, do gun runs, rocket runs, firing hellfires, toes. So, I mean, in this moment, you essentially have the entire United States Marine Corps armament. That's a good way to describe it. At one time. All working together. And yeah, it, it was really wild. rad yeah. to see that. Like, And it kept up, too, because, um, you know, the, I think also people underestimate the effectiveness of like a really good sandbag sandbag bunker with them you know they're fortified man a, a good sandbag bunker can take a lot of shit we saw that in Fallujah but you know they were dug in they were fortified and they kept it up all night and as they're trying to figure out how we're going to cross maintain our momentum while fighting back we really got bogged down there so I remember being on radio watch that night and hearing the radio call to keep Artie on call every 30 minutes. I believe it was every 30 minutes. Just just send them every 30 minutes no matter what. They're sending rounds. And um, also got to take off our mop suits at that, at that period. So we were all pumped because I think at that point they had ruled out that NBC wasn't going to be an issue. You know, we were... <laughs> Strange little fact. I don't know if you guys did or not. Did you guys carry birds? We had birds. Birds. Yeah, we had birds. Like actual bird, like, like animal actual birds? animals in ca in cages. No. For NBC. Really. Early warning. Like canary and coal mine kind of shit or what? So like, if the bird dies or yeah. you see it acting funky, it could be another possible indicator that you're in the presence of some sort of uh, NBC agent. In so so you guys are in your gas mask mop gear stuff carrying cages of birds and, and observing they're, them they're in our vehicles <laughs> that's a fucking I, think, dude, I had no idea at that i've point, never heard that <laughs> yeah. at that point honestly i think all the birds had died from fucking heat and stupid shit and what? the vehicles like just again Who's, when you stuff like 13 infantry dudes with a war's worth of an arsenal in that vehicle like cases of 40 mic mic cases of 556 five, yeah small rockets demo and like you're maneuvering and shit's falling over you got privates falling all over the place and the, i think poor the birds fucking birds like wh whose job was it to take care of the fucking birds i think it was the you know the, there's an actual nbc mos and i think that was their function dude i mean that's a whole fucking no pun intended animal in and of itself like <laughs> i mean they got to eat and fucking drink and yeah, Dude, it's, that it's is bizarre. Man, that's fucking twisted. So I think at that point they knew that NBC wasn't going to be an, an issue, and they just said, "Take your shirt yeah, off. take your take your mop seats off." And so you guys are, I, I guess I didn't realize like this lasted a long time, like oh, through the night, overnight, and then yeah, I think we were probably there fighting it out for about forty eight hours. No shit, just on and off, on and off, on and off. Yeah. Did you guys take any casualties? Not there. We did actually earlier on. <laughs> um, one of our snipers got got hit. Um, I think it was just north of the Basra, so still early on, maybe within the first 96 hours. Um, I think he just took a shot to the gut and was it went under the armor, you know. And Did he make it? it was catastrophic. No, he, he died. Oh, shit. Yep. And then, but but at that at that bridge uh, or the you know, the area right there, the Diala River, we did not take any casualties, fortunately. We, we had some injuries, like <laughs> one of our guys in my squad ate shit as we were finally crossing, because that was wild. Just crossing, we were taking contact. Like, that, the contact remained up until the point where we're, we're crossing. So now we're, we're getting shot at. We're on foot. Vehicles are trying to make their ways. As a matter of fact, like, the, the tanks and the Amtreks couldn't cross where we did. They, they left which was also kind of weird seeing them leave and go to, they had to go down further down the river and, and they had another crossing point. So now we, we, we actually make a, what I think was a pretty substantial foot mobile movement from that location into Southern Baghdad. I don't know how long it was again, no GPS or anything like that, but I mean, we were, we were patrolling on foot for a while. And so we, 
getting contacted while you're not ju- just initially once we got on the other side but i mean we had danger close cobras right over us um as we were crossing and they're firing so like we're on the bridge we're taking contact cobras are just so low i i felt i could grab the skid and um taking out targets it was wild it was a lot going on I mean, that's like shit out of a movie for sure i mean it that's kind of what it you know looked like and felt like because again like i'm looking left and looking right i'm looking above me and there's shit going on everywhere, everywhere. every every flank there's somebody shooting somebody shooting above you uh when we got over there tanks were even um had i think had crossed at that point i remember being in in contact with the tank had a tank round go off real close to us we thought that we were like uh like we'll be all right because we were right next to the tank and there was a big hole in the ground like a crater and damn no that was too close yeah for that main tank round because we were basically like online with it but we were low so we thought hey it's all good we needed a i think my squad leader's trying to get him to fire a, an he round into a, a building so we could go clear it it wasn't like a good breach point and it was just like hit it and then we'll go in and that man that i just remember that blast just got rocked and uh that was also like on the other side right so we've been fighting it out for 48 hours now we're on the other side and you're able to like see the carnage and it was pretty wild man i mean there was bodies everywhere and there was like if you think about what we, the weapon systems that were employed, and would and then actually being able to see that effect like on a human body, yeah. you know what I mean? Like I saw, I I, I remember just taking a pause one second because it looked really bizarre. But I saw a dude, and I, you know, I'll throw this out here too because you know you get older and you think about things and you gain respect, right? There's always kind of like that theme of. To some level, you respect your enemy, right? And, you know, it's the Iraqi army. Later on, they become our allies, right? We fight with the Iraqi army years and years after that. So I don't, I'm not in any way really trying to disrespect the warriors that were on the other side. They were doing their part in the fight. We're doing our part, right? But, I mean, I saw some shit that was just like, Jesus Christ, man. Like one of the, I came across a guy and it was just his, just his lower torso. But it was completely intact. I don't know if like he got hit with a ball of Willie Pete and it just melted him in, in half, or if he got hit by like a tank round, like a direct hit. I don't know what it was, but it was it was bizarre. And I, it was again, you know, we're stopping for a second. I'm taking a knee and I'm sitting right next to this dude, and it, it's almost as if his. You know, his torso is like still sizzling. It was it was bizarre. Yeah. Seeing all that. So that was the up real up close in person where, okay, now I'm really seeing bodies all over the ground and um the the carnage that kind of comes along with it. Do you have any perspective numbers wise as to how many I mean, even a ballpark of KIA on the other side? No. Man, I, I don't. I mean, I, mean I would I would probably say like as far as like how many people i saw and stuff like that or my my best estimate would probably dozens yeah dozens yeah dozens certainly um but an actual number i don't know and and you know what else we saw quite a bit of which was i think also a little strange it certainly was strange at the time and i don't think this actually gets talked about very much but we saw a lot of uniforms and ak's just lying on the ground really yeah uh iraqi uniforms defectors they were just like oh no shit whoa Fuck this, I'm out. Fuck this, I'm out. Yeah. I mean, we saw that a lot all the way up to Baghdad. We saw that a lot. Uh, I think there was a lot of defectors as they really saw the the total might yeah. of everything that we were bringing to the table. They were like, fuck they this. They were like, no, nah, this shit, no. Nah. Because, no, I mean, no. again, they didn't have, like, near the assets that we had. They didn't yeah. really stand a chance, you yeah. know. Well, and, and just culturally, that... Yeah, true. that profession is very different for them. You know, it's not revered the way that it is here. You know, by and large. But uh, so what? Okay, so once you crossed, you see the carnage. It's fucking mayhem. Bodies everywhere. 
how long did you spend there? Was there any sensitive site exploitation and intel it was it was just like holy fuck and you just <laughs> no. keep moving no like you, you guys didn't look at anything or, or gather any type of no yeah 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 we certainly did like we come come across bodies and we're searching pockets and stuff for intel maps and stuff like that yeah another stupid side note infantry thing you know what another big thing you're looking for mm. everybody wanted in the infantry a pistol oh yeah and and you know a, a, a souvenir wise yeah yeah uh so there was always the motivation to go search for the intel and do the right thing because you may get the chance. Or, get, or everybody was also like collecting the bayonets. Yeah, oh, I got this style bayonet, the, this style bayonet of a, of an AK. You know, so you know, it's it's an interesting prospect that uh, human nature for millennia has has always ha- had that spoils of war aspect that that I think is almost wired into our psyche that way like i don't think it's really taught or passed down i think it's it's almost a an inherent prey drive almost that exists in human beings that you know from a con- like a old school primal conquering standpoint like i'm taking this you know that that just exists absolutely you know? and, and it's just in in everybody that, that's <clears> in <throat> those positions for the most part like because it is i mean we we took down saddam's palace up in Tikrit. And some of your guys came in after. I mean, the shit that they were trying to take off that place is like, I mean, what the fuck is wrong with you guys? Right, like stealing right. toilet brushes and fucking soap dishes. I mean, just anything that could that wasn't fucking bolted down. It was like you guys are a bunch of fucking Vikings. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, savage. Yeah, I mean, uh, anyway, I don't mean to get sidetracked. No, but, um, no. All right, so so you you end up you're moving through there. Uh, that's in South Baghdad. Was that the most north you guys pushed at that point? At that point, yeah, and we, like I said, we made a foot mobile movement after that to kind of get to the point to where all the vehicles were, like the rally point to where we could get back mounted up. And then um, another thing that I think I feel fortunate that I was able to see, and it was kind of weird because there was a complete shift. You know, we had just done all that. Now we're entering South Baghdad, and it's the complete opposite. No resistance. And the local populace, almost like in a parade, the the gratitude that they had was very interesting to see that dynamic shift and how thankful they were, you know, and they were just cheering us and they were saying, you know, good Bush, good Bush, down Saddam, down Saddam. And, uh, uh, you know, thank you, America. Thank you, America. Thank you, America. And. Now we're in Baghdad. It's very urbanized, very populated. And, yeah, at that point, I say that. we My unit actually stopped at the Martyrs Monument in Baghdad, which is uh, kind of like one of their war memorials areas. So we stop. As soon as we get there, we, we get in a little tick. Um, and I, I, it was one of those where there's, again, there's a lot going on. And I, I couldn't ever discern, like, the point of origin. I just uh, distinctly remember watching one of our snipers. Because, you know, also, like, you know, gunfights like that are weird sometimes, man. Like, what takes your attention um, and what you, you focus on is sometimes, you know, it's not, not towards maybe where you're supposed to be looking. But I remember seeing uh, one of our snipers, and he was just getting it on an M40, um, taking, like, multiple shots. And I just remember him I, looking at him and just walking, watching him work the bolt, and he was just taking multiple shots. And I was kind of looking, you know. But I, he's probably got a target in his, in his optic, and I'm just looking for my naked eye, and I, I can't really see. I just remember kind of getting sucked into that. But we got a little bit of resistance there upon arrival, and then after that, nothing. And it, it kind of transitioned for us, to a mission set to more of uh, just as overall security posture. So we just did mounted security patrols in our little sector of Baghdad there until until we pushed down south. I will say that, you know, the uh, that picture of Saddam, right, coming down, the, the tank uh, or the, the utility vehicle that's, I think it's like a mechanic vehicle for the tanks, pulled down the Saddam... Uh, statue made headline news on papers everywhere. That was my unit, third battalion, fourth Marines with first tank battalion. I was not there at that moment, but that was my unit. 
And after the statue came down, it was, you know, security patrols. And then that's it. That's a wrap. And we're pushing back down south. And, and that was weird because we stopped, I believe, in the, the vicinity of Nazaria. I, I think, or no, excuse me, it was not Nazaria. It was Diwania. We stopped in Diwania. And I think they were getting their, because everything is this weird, like, admin environment almost, but we had just pushed up this whole way, kind of fighting it out. And now we're going back, and Everything's it was like, is there still resistance or is there not? And then there was also, like, we're waiting for them to get their shit together to figure out how we're getting back to Kuwait. And uh, strangely enough, I'm pretty sure from Diwania all the way south to Kuwait, upon the culmination of that that push, we went back in, like, buses. Like, they got Iraqi buses, and we did not go back down in the in our vehicles. And everybody was like, this is what the, this is so strange. Like, yeah. like we don't have any uh, Means protection of, or anything. Yeah. Like, in, in this, it wasn't like a school bus. It was like a city bus type of setup. And we hit Kuwait, and that, that, was, that was it. Wow. That was that deployment. Dude, what a fascinating deployment. It's interesting. I mean, having been there uh, that same period, agreed, there were times where I found myself looking around – you know, because in, in combat environments, it, it's so blinders on, uh, microscopic, fucking singularly focused. And I found myself similarly, you know, on, on a number of occasions, like stopping and, and pulling back and looking around being like, holy fuck. Like, dude, look at this shit that's going on around us right now. It's like having box seats in history. Absolutely. That, you know? I felt like that quite a bit yeah because you know we were with, with there there were lines and there were you know big offensive movements and conventional warfare and it, you know it, because so much of the iraq and afghanistan experiences that are discussed and talked about whether it's here or anywhere are very we're in this fob we're fucking gathering intel it's a, it's a very dynamic special operations get intel do a hit come back you know exactly fighting amongst where you're living you know and and so little of both of those campaigns were traditional and conventional kind of what you just described and it's, it's fascinating that there's such a disparity yeah it's different it was very different you know yeah. it was very different there's there's not much of that out there because th that was such a short period there's exactly. not very many people that were involved in it and then it and then it was never that way again and i don't know if it ever will be again yeah i mean yeah, maybe not. I mean, I, I think you probably see that in Ukraine. I mean, if it was yeah, something like yeah, that, yeah. I mean, there it won't be, I don't think. But Or for us, you know. Yeah, it's the, hard to say. I mean. I know that they're completely changing how the Marine Corps operates and kind of focusing yeah. on the South China Sea and yeah. more expeditionary and stuff. So I'm, I'm not so sure that, because I've, I've, I've kind of heard that although the Marine Corps did very well in that push, I think they're trying to, reorganize and, and just push them back out to the ships yeah much more maritime oriented and for the future if there's going to be a land campaign like that focus a little bit more on the army yeah. instead of the marine corps it's kind of what i've heard is how they're structuring things but yeah. we'll see fascinating shit uh, amazing stories man um so that was your first deployment you come home was there a part of you that when you came home you're like holy fuck dude i just got it like that's what I signed up for, and we just fucking did did the thing. And I mean, what? Where was your head at coming home from that? There was definitely that uh, sentiment, but I will also say that there was also like it was kind of hard to describe, like the way that I felt coming back home, going on leave, interacting with all the kids. Let's let's call it what it is. We're still eighteen years old. That I just went to high school with and shit. And they have, I have no way to articulate anything. They have no clue what's going on. They have no clue why we're in Iraq and like the whole dynamic. And so that was weird. So I kind of just lived in it with myself and enjoyed, enjoyed my, enjoyed my leave, enjoyed being with my family and stuff. But a lot of those instances, like for example, like that first armor to armor engagement had a big impact on me, right? Going forward. But that was completely self internalized for over a decade. Like it's not as if after that happened, we were cutting it up and bullshitting like, damn, that was gnarly. That never happened. There was never any of that talk because the majority of the people in my vehicle, for instance, didn't see it. Yeah. It was like me and the other dude, the other boot, 
on Ariel watching that track that kind of really got that front row seat to that. And so we, I don't ever remember, even within the other vehicles, where like the vehicle, for example, that they got engaged and barely missed, man. And that would have that would have been catastrophic to that vehicle too because the armor on the AVs, like 12.7, can slice right through it. Yeah. I think 7.62 by 5.4 would go right through it. So had it hit, had it just been a little bit lower, and then what's in the vehicle, you know, all the ordnance that we have in the vehicle, it would have been completely catastrophic. Yeah. So none of those guys, I even remember as we continue pushing forward, because there was always so much more going on. And you're, you're, that's behind you, and now we're just thinking ahead, and like that, you know, call it what it is, probably combat stress. Like, that we weren't like, damn, that was crazy. Did you, do you, you know, did you, like you that never moved, happened. Moved you were just, and maybe that's because it was so fast paced, or any moment you could get, you were just trying to shut your eyes for 20 minutes. Yeah. That none of that ever got talked about. And then, and you know, I'm sure we're going to get into it, but the, the op tempo after that, getting back into country, was also so fast that none of that ever got talked about. And so, like, I would, once I kind of, like, years later, like, literally decades later, plus, that's why I, I reconnected and tried to go over those some of those experiences with the leadership of my platoon to be like, fuck, man, did, you know, that happened, you know? And he's like, yeah, dude, it was pretty crazy. Yeah. But, um, yeah, because after we got back, initially like on the way out in kuwait it was like victory yeah done won the war the war's over boys like war's yeah. over yeah right then we get back to the states go on post deployment leave the second we get back the second it's, it's been 30 days you know go 30 days post deployment leave real nice second we get back they're like we're starting a workup for what what do you mean you know the, it's over another dynamic in the infantry i thought that was interesting is and then because that that all gets to because we're going back right we've got a date and i'm like holy shit you know what do you mean going back everything like it's over right well the now the insurgency is kicking up and years later i realized that i'd had no clue like was is it just local iraqis right that's what i kind of initially thought but i come to learn and realize years later i did you know some college focused on my my program was strategic studies and defense analysis through like SOCOM had like a, a little degree career path that you could take that was pretty cool. So I learned a little bit more about how and why all that happened in the U Iranian influence. influence and them sponsoring all these Shia militias fighting us, just doing what we do, man, like unconventional warfare against us. And that's really what that majority of that insurgency was. And they were like, nope, an insurgency starting and we're, and we're, we're going right back. And it was like, shit okay now we're in a workup and it's day on stay on we're in the field every day and and we're getting you know new gear issued we're getting some new marines coming in and one of the crazy things i was going to get at is all of the marines that went ua because we had a lot of i mean again the infantry is interesting because it's like you don't have you have a lot of people that did not choose to be in the infantry one in the marine corps wanted to do four years get some college benefits and went in on an open contract they get assigned to you know, go to the infantry and they're like whatever man i'm just riding this out to to do my four years and get out and that's good you know we need people to do that but i mean they're just not that really a traditional warrior and and they're like after that first deployment they're like fuck this i'm out i had a dude in my squad never seen him again after we got back that first moment we got back and they were like we're going into another workup we're going on we're going right back he left the next day, and I've never seen him since. No shit. Wow. Gone. He was yeah, like, wow. no, like that was enough. Yeah. Like, I'm good. Um, Wild. So, all right, so you guys do a, another workup, and was your second deployment then still in the infantry? Yeah. Okay. Uh, all, yeah. All right, so your second deployment, you, you do a workup. You know you're going back. The insurgency from <clears throat> the Iran side is building up. What did you go back over and do for that second pump? Uh, spent the majority of that deployment in the Ambar province. And initially, it was really mundane. Just uh, We were tasked with security on ASP Wolf, Saddam's, one of, the, one of his biggest ASPs. <clears throat> there was a uh, American civilian 
contracted like EOD company that was doing uh, controlled detonations and massive area. I mean, I don't know. Some of the posts that we would go drive out to would take us 30 minutes to get there. So it was just security. We would go do security patrols in the area, both mounted and, and uh, you know, on foot, but nothing. It was just really boring. Um, and, of course, this is also the time where we're learning about IEDs. IEDs become, are these thing, right? Like at that time, that acronym, we didn't even know, you know, what's an IED, right? So, you know, we're cautious of that, that the TTP at the time was using 155 rounds, uh, and I think fortunately for us at that time, at least they were still like developing their SOPs and TTPs. They weren't as sophisticated. That comes into play. I think here in a little bit, we end up getting hit pretty good, but, um, that's it. You know, we're, we're doing uh, security and then, uh, the Blackwater contractors get hung in Fallujah. So we get that word and then it was like, it's on, we're, we're pushing to Fallujah and we're going to go. Fuck people up. Yep. We're going to go, uh, we're going to go get it on. And I remember that feeling being like, fuck yeah. Like talk about, you want some motivation to go, go do your fucking job, man. I mean, cause I, I even remember like the civilian contractors at the ASP got that word before we did. And they were, they were clearly affected by it. You know, and we were like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> we finally got the word, everything that, you know, had happened. So, we pushed out and went to Fallujah, and, f and for the re remainder of the deployment, we spent a lot of the time in that area, and, and we did, I guess, um, the first Fallujah push into, uh, I, I forget the name of it, uh, al Fajr or Phantom Fury, I get them mixed up, because we were there the following year, too. Um, and, you know, the uh, the idea or the the sentiment going into Fallujah was, you know, this is where they have, uh, this is where the enemy and the insurgency has come to, you know, really fight it out. And, and there is, uh, it's not just like our, our Iraqis, you know, we were learning about and getting intel. There was Chechenian fighters and freedom fighters from really all over, right? This is like the Jihad Super Bowl. And uh, so, you know, the Marine Corps had their plan. And I know there was a soft presence there as well. Uh, we saw them. And uh, that was, I would say, you know, to throw that in there, an influence on me, you know, we would see, you know, these guys and they don't look like us, you know, beards and short EM4s and cool optics and shit like that. And we're like, you know, who are these guys? And so I would see, you know, probably NSW and some contractors probably as well operating in and around the area. And that certainly had a uh, an effect on me as I'm making sure I got my boot bands on and, you know. <laughs> Fucking shave. My, if I'm shaved and my uniform is serviceable in combat. Yeah. Um, some stupid infantry shit. But um, my my battalion, you know, as it as it gets kicked into it, has uh, in in my company in particular is assigned the northeast sector of the city. And um, that was a really frustrating fight. You know, every, everybody knows that that first one. You know, we basically got a block in and, and got stopped. We took contact and we had resistance up until that point. And then we sat in the city for 60 days. Uh, we were told to pack for two. Sat in the city for 60 days in a security defensive position, getting IDF, you know, getting mortared every day, um, <laughs> dodging mortars and rockets every day. And, and as they were working out, whatever they were going to work out. Um, but, you know, up, up until that point, we're certainly, you know, we got engaged both by personnel, small arms, and indirect. I don't not 100% on the road uh, naming conventions. I think it was Tampa, the north south running road that bordered to the east. We pushed up on that road beyond the triangle as we were trying to assume our northeast position there and start pushing in. I mean, initially it was, you know, house to house, we're pushing in, dismounted with tanks and AVs around us. And um, we started taking small arms. Um, which is also another kind of weird thing where like where it's like seeing impacts like around us and then also indirect fire where I'm I remember like seeing 
explosions and, and initially not knowing what it was, just seeing like puffs of the earth kind of come up. But, you know, you don't see that blast. There's no flash or anything. I mean, it's there for a microsecond and it's gone. But and then being like, fuck, that's fucking mortars. They're shooting mortars at us, you know, and they were like landing very close. And I was actually even kind of like, damn, I can't believe that that we didn't get affected by that one or like another one would go off next to us. And I didn't feel anything. So they must have been maybe just, you know, 60s or smaller. So there, I mean, they were giving it to us before we were even able to dismount. I mean, we're not even in the city yet. We're just driving, you know, in a big green military convoy. So super easy target. Not only, not to mention that highway system was kind of elevated. So they had just like, you know, perfect target to shoot at. Um, had a guy on my uh, turret in the seven ton we were in make a pretty epic shot with just a good old standard M sixteen A four and oh. an ACOG. Yeah, it was I, probably the longest shot I ever saw, just from like not from a precision weapon, you know. And it was probably three hundred and fifty yards, single shot. Dude went down, black man jams, just like really everybody talks about. I was thought that all that was also <clears throat> kind of like like these guys are really wearing like black pajamas. <laughs> What was the uh, the context? Like, how did it go down? Enemy in the open. Dude shooting. Just standing out in the middle yeah, of the street? Yeah, he was what? completely vulnerable, like in between a, a, a few houses. And, uh, you know, the ACOG was still pretty new at that time. It was for the infantry, you know. And so, like, and he was up in, in the turret of the seven-ton that we were in. We were in trucks at this point. We also had Amtrak's with us, but we were actually in seven ton trucks that was the new mode of transpo for the infantry at the time for the rest of that deployment we rode in those seven ton trucks no armor no armor at this point still still early on in the game so light skinned um but anyways yeah so drops that dude mortars are kind of landing all around us like shit it's it's going on before we have even dismounted we dismount we take the first like few houses no, no resistance at that point. Like nobody in those particular houses. They had kind of pushed back, right? They were kind of smart about it. And then we stopped. And then from there, we sat there for 60 days. And it was brutal, man. It was brutal because no sleep. Only packed for a couple of days. We're getting mortared. Rocket. Um, so you're playing that constant game of like, is it going to be this one, right? Because like the movies, some things are like the movies, some things aren't. One thing was whenever you're getting indirect, I found, as everybody did, you know, you hear a mortar coming down at you. You hear the whistle. And so it's almost like, man, is that going to be the one? I'm listening to it. Is that going to be the one? And talk about how close in proximity some of those were. We had another one that did not detonate. We were up on the roof of the building where we were pretty much stationary at. I don't know if it was a dud or if they didn't pull a pin again or whatever it was. Landed right in the in the courtyard of the backyard. Fins up, stuck in the mud. Holy fuck. Just right there. We we're just looking down because we heard it coming down. And we we're just like, you know, you're doing that. You're kind of like tensing up. Yeah, you're bracing. You know what I mean? That's, you know, get ready for it. And nothing. Why were you guys there for that that long? Great I mean, question. How, I, I, how did I, I go from two to 60? Yeah, from from my, uh, I think it was 60, by the way. Either way, it was a long fucking time. It was time. certainly longer than 30, I, th I think. Um, I think they were there, again, to my understanding, you know, General Mattis was working with, like, the city and the Iraqi army, and they were essentially, like, trying to negotiate peace because he was like, we're literally about to destroy this entire town. Like, you've seen what we've do we, we could do it two blocks in and many other Marine Corps units got way more. I think Cody Alford's unit, man, they got into some, some shit. And that was just those first few days of that push. And, uh, so they were trying to, you know, kind of get it figured out. And I think they ended up taking more, a more like diplomatic way out of that fight. And, and then we pulled out, we never advanced beyond that. Now our snipers, our battalion snipers did, our, I think our battalion commander, because we, we kept taking, we would get little um, pop shots, right? They're kind of like probing our lines or their FOs almost would kind of come close and 
like our snipers went beyond our lines. So they would go establish like a, an urban hide, two-man team, a couple, you know, beyond our lines, and they were cleaning house. They had a shit ton of targets of opportunity because they were kind of like, you know, in that hidden little really perfect urban sniper setup, and they were cleaning house. We were kind of getting the residual effects of what they weren't able to hit as they were kind of maneuvering on us. They would start engaging us, had a couple good call for fire missions from Rotary at that point. But again, like playing into their their defenses. Man, I saw a couple Cobras just give this fucking structure hell, man. I'm, I'm talking multiple runs. And every single run, RPGs at the birds, no matter what it took. And you would, you know, you just think after that next run comes, and this is very close. Like, how are they still shooting at them? How are they still shooting at them, you know? <laughs> and we lost a dude. We lost a couple guys. And uh, one way, uh, they were taking fire from this structure, this house. And so, of course, initially, you, you, you know, you're, you're either suppressing it with automatic fire, arranging for the, a squad of infantry to go hit it, or you're just suppressing it to see if it'll stop. And it just keeps up, right? So they gave it, they gave it everything they could. I'm talking AT4s, Mark 19, um, the the weapon systems from tanks like the 240, the 50, mm -hmm. and and even main tank rounds, I believe, on that house. And they were still, and so they were like, okay, we, I mean, last resort, let's send a squad in. And the number one man, dude, he he ate it in a in the hallway, and I think it was a sandbag bunker. And uh, so he, he got killed. A friend of mine, good buddy of mine, was he was in an elevated position. Long story short on that one, uh, just got – he didn't have a cover. It was, it was kind of a shitty position to be in. But, again, you know, like <laughs> the nature of the infantry, you know, like, hey, get a position on top of that whatever hill, building. You know, it's even another dude or something in it. You know, you got little to no direction. You have, nobody knows what's on that flank. Could be a fucking enemy platoon massing over there. You have no clue, right? Not a lot of SA. It's the nature of the beast. They went up into an elevated position, had, like, no cover, got engaged by automatic fire, like, PKM, lit him up, stitched him up, he died right there in in that position. And He was a good friend. Yeah, yeah, man, and it was shitty because the dudes that were around him, the dude who was up there with him was a, a small space. It was like a tower. I, I'm not sure if, if it was a water tower or not. I was not at that particular location. But it was like a tower, and it was only enough room for him and, and his dude. He was the team leader, and, and him and his, one of his guys. And hit, like their shit got, I mean, they got stitched up bad. Like their optics got shot off their fucking weapons. They got a good burst on them. So he gets hit all through his midsection, fucks up his sappies, his vest, just hits him all over. He dies. But they got to get him down, man. And so, like, it sucked. All the guys that had to get him down, he's, you know, bleeding everywhere. And That moment for our unit, our company, was pretty significant. That was the closest to home KIA at that point. We lost a couple dudes. It was the same day. The same day that that dude got hit in the house was the same day as my buddy died. So then it really became like, even though we weren't pushing beyond that, we we're still getting resistance. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, it, again, it, he was, he was a badass dude, man. It was like that. That's that story of like only the good die, right? Uh, hardcore, hard charger, badass guy. Have your back, do anything for you. He was the one. And and the dude that was up there, he ended up our subsequent deployment after that. I became his team leader for the next deployment, and uh, that fucked him up bad, man. I mean, he's he's not good even to this day. Having he was young, having that his his team leader die right there next to him, no cover, nowhere to go, nothing to do. Didn't know what to do. Do I try to drag him down by myself as they were trying to organize? a squad to suppress that, to get guys up there to, to take him down this long ladder 
they were getting engaged on the ground. Another one of my buddies got shot right through seven, 17 Bravo on his saw. Optic blew up in his face. Took shrapnel to his helmet in his face. And uh, so, yeah, that was shitty, man. Um, they were... Uh, they were definitely there to fight. And, you know, like you heard stories, you know, about drugs. Because I even heard stories about, like, how our green tip, our M855, was just slicing through dudes and they weren't not very effective. Because um, a lot of them were doped up, supposedly, you know. Um, so that was pretty gnarly. Even though it was, a, you know, it was just a couple blocks in, it was still some pretty crazy shit. Yeah. What uh, impact did that have on you and the collective group when you lost those two guys in terms of the the motivation to fight? Did it intensify it? Did it suppress it? Like, where, where were, were your heads at? It's almost indescribable to me, the feeling that I got after that. The mix of, like, rage... Of, of just sadness, of uh, hate, of just really wanting to get cut loose. That feeling of, like, that has happened and we're stuck here and we can't continue moving and pushing the fight because they're all there. This is it. They're all in there, and they all keep Fuck probing me. our lines, fucking with us, hitting us with pop shots, indirect, all the fucking time. This shit's going off. One of my best friends just died. That feeling of just not being able to... Do something about it was terrible, man. Terrible. You guys stayed there for a couple of months, and then what, what was the... Pulled it, out. They just said, okay, fucking enough, come out? Yep. Was that demoralizing? Yeah, I think so. I I really... Because, I mean, think what happened after that. If, you know, people remember what happened after that was the 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 real push, the big push or the Marine Corps finally went in again because whatever they were trying to work out didn't work. Yeah. You know, the insurgency stayed there. They kept organizing. They, they um, sure, certainly, uh, you know, refitted, and then they kept, they kept it on. And so then that next big push went down, and strangely enough, basically timing-wise, my, my battalion in particular got relieved by 8th Marines. So we went back to the States, <laughs> same exact routine, post-deployment leave, come back, we're going back, worked right up into a, a workup, did a full workup, came back in country, and we relieved 8th Marines, the same unit that relieved us six months later, you know, we're there, and at that time, the big push in Fallujah was culminating, so we came in, we relieved 8th Marines, we relieved, relieved a few units within third marine battalion and they got chewed up bad man so the majority of that fighting at that point had um also kind of stopped so that was frustrating because we all had the sense of we fucking missed the big push you know and um we got contact a few times on that that third deployment um id'd you know <laughs> like everybody um but yeah, I mean, and that's pushing into the, into that deployment. I, I will say that kind of going back on the uh, second deployment and the whole development of IEDs and all that, and that becoming an issue. And, and I'm I'm not even sure if this plays into the infantry. That another reason, I guess, maybe a motivation for me to kind of want to go to a unit where you can have a little bit more flexibility with your tactical planning. And I don't, rem I don't even remember if it was before or after Fallujah. I, I really don't remember. We were operating out of Al Assad because after we pulled out of Fallujah, we went back further west and started operating out of Al Assad. We were doing, we were doing, uh, we were watching bronze and doing a lot of like counter IED stuff. So we're watching the road, looking for people and placing IEDs. There's only two ways to get to the AO we were working in, in like basic like infantry tactics 101. How do you channelize your enemy? You know, you sabotage one way, you know that they're going. That forces them into another, and that's where you hit them. And that's exactly what happened to us. We knew it was going to happen, and it was like there's nothing we can do about it. We literally, we were using both these routes to get to our AO. There's only two ways to get there, and we would alternate as much as we could, 
And one night they were like, hey, the bridge at Uranium was blown. It's, comp- it's not passable. Tomorrow morning you guys are going to go do a route clearance on bronze. So we were like, okay. You know I mean? We do need, I get it. Like we got to confirm or deny the presence of the enemy in, in that area. And if we get hit, then we get hit. We fight it out and kill bad guys and we're achieving our objective. That's a, a nature of the beast with, with the infantry. But it just sucked knowing that, yeah, we're about to get hit. And it happened. And that kind of jacked with me going forward beyond that was like that feeling of expecting it, knowing it's going to happen, and then it hitting it or it, us getting hit by an IED and not being able to do shit about it. No armor on our truck. And it sucked also because we had just pushed beyond a level, uh, a pocket of urbanization out into the rural area, heading north towards the uh, Haditha Dam area. So we're looking at desert, wide open desert. And we had two perfectly placed IEDs. And as soon as my truck got into the middle of both of them, like perfect kill zone, both went off. Wow. And we essentially, I also <clears throat> didn't even kind of realize this at the time, of what we had. I mean, we were just worked through the situation, got our casualties off the truck and ground medevaced back to Al Assad. But it was a, essentially a mass casualty drill. We had like eight plus casualties on my truck. Luckily, nobody died, but um, a lot of face shrapnel, squad leaders in the cab of the truck, enclosed. So your squad leader, a dude in the turret, and then the driver. And those three dudes got it pretty bad gnarly shrapnel from you know the 155 shell squad leader lost his eye it was just hanging out of his face shrapnel from the glass and everything windshield all the tires completely shredded uh in it they they dug the ieds a little too deep though and so what we got was a lot of just uh earth of just the earth and the asphalt getting blown up into us like dudes were getting hit with chunks of rock you know at my guy next to me Got just hit with a massive chunk of rock, and he went unconscious. He was kind of like in my lap as soon as it happened. I went completely unconscious on that one. I was out, completely out. Any significant injuries for you, or was it just knocked out? I think I messed up my back on that one. I think it... No shrapnel. The the force, no, fortunately not. I mean, uh, no, not for me. Not not including like earth. it It was weird. We were picking like sand out of our face like weeks later, like little sand little pebbles out of our face for for weeks it was it was bizarre but uh, i think i jacked up my back on that one but i like it no purple heart or anything and and, and at that time you know you're, you're not again you're not getting a purple heart unless you got shot or you're, you're bleeding um but a lot of injuries we had to vehicles completely out and strangely enough also a cobra overhead watched it wow he saw the saw the impact from the area. He was heading back to Al Assad. Immediately started circling for us, looking for the trigger man, because that's also our our mindset is like, whoever's still able able and capable, dismount. And because, so, and not to throw any shade on the army, like it is what it is. At that time, when this IED tactic was was still new, the army was getting hit. And they were pushing out of the kill zone. They were just getting hit and pushing. And when we kind of got into the country and we were learning about this, we were like, yeah, we're Marines. We're not doing that. Like, if we get hit, we're going to go try to find them and kill them. We're pushing through the whole platoon online. We're going to go clear buildings. We're going to get the trigger man. We're going to go fucking kill them. And we get to their team room and we jump in there and everybody's in camis and they look at us and they're like, what the fuck? And we're like... (laughs) What's up? You know, and they're like, you, you fucking belt fed Marines. We thought for sure you guys would be in camouflage, you know, utilities. <laughs>